Joining me now is senior journalist with News Corp, Patrick Carly. And Patrick, let's start with this Melbourne-Sydney rivalry. It's taken a bit of a bizarre twist, if you ask me. After New South Wales Premier Chris Minns vowed to end working from home flexibility across the New South Wales government, well, the Victorian Premier has uh, taken a different approach. They are very happy for public servants to come in only three days a week and a Victorian government spokesperson released this statement. Any public servants from New South Wales who like flexibility in their workplace should consider moving to Victoria. Well, this is a rather bizarre statement, Patrick. The Melbourne CBD is dying. Vacancy rates are the highest of any capital city. You would think the government would be doing all it can to bring its workers back rather than boasting about uh, allowing them to work from home. Absolutely. I mean, Melbourne is a sad place. I mean, you walk down Elizabeth Street or Swanson Street, there's no-one there. There's lots of shuttered-up sort of boards for restaurants and cafes that no longer exist. Um, the pandemic ended two and a half years ago. Why are people still working <laughs> from home? They do less. Um, uh, they don't engage. They, they do other things besides work during the day. They wear boxer shorts for Zoom meetings. They're not present, both literally and metaphorically. Yeah. And, and I mean, and that really, as business groups say, that has a real impact mm. on business and getting things done. Absolutely, and uh, particularly in in Melbourne, where, like, as you explained, it, it is depressed. You know, Sydney CBD mm. seemed to bounce back very quickly after COVID. Melbourne's a different story. It's fantastic if there's a major event, a footy sure. match and there's crowds there. But day to day, so many businesses are struggling to hold on to the ones that haven't closed already. And you would think a very easy fix would be to say, OK, public servants, mm. come back in. We're Absolutely. back to normal now. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, the one good thing about the pandemic was um, driving to and from work. Um, there's, no, there's not the peak hour traffic that there always has been for yeah. decades. Um, people aren't coming into the city. And that has, obviously has a huge effect on the businesses that are trying to sell, and, you know, trying to, you know, retailers and people, you know, uh, making lunches and all sorts of things. Oh, yeah. You don't have the critical mass of people. Absolutely. And uh, no longer the world's most livable city. Melbourne does have a new crown and unwanted one, sadly, has become Australia's youth homelessness capital with more than 15,000 youngsters across the city reaching out for assistance for homelessness services in the 2023 financial year. This is according to a new report from Homelessness Australia. The chief executive, Kate Colvin, is warning that the housing crisis is so deep in Melbourne that even low and middle income earners are finding it very difficult to uh, find an affordable rental property. That is true. And the policies of the state government mm. that are driving investors out of the market and shrinking the number of rental properties, sure. that's driving up rents. Uh, if you're going to pump up land tax and make it unattractive for mum and dad investors, mm they're going to put their money elsewhere. Yeah, look, I think the takeaway from that is the fact that, um, you know, low and middle income earners are actually struggling to afford to pay rent uh, mm. or to find anywhere to rent. Yeah. Um, there's not enough housing. Uh, the homeless services are talking about the fact that they, they are overwhelmed. They can't actually help all the people, the huge numbers of people who need help, who are asking for help. Um, it really doesn't, it doesn't make Melbourne look good at the moment, does it really? We've got all these things going on. Everything's going poorly. Uh, we've got the biggest debt. Um, we've got potholes all over Victoria <laughs> because we can't afford to fill them. Uh, and you've got, you've got issues like this. Most but, businesses uh, going bust or yes. going into state. Uh, but yet you look at all, so many of the stats that, and uh, mm. the indicators of how we're doing and Victoria, Melbourne is struggling and uh, as a... Once very proud Melbourneian, it doesn't fill me with joy to say that. Uh, mm. And I hold not just the Labor government, but the Liberal opposition responsible because if they were even remotely electable, mm. Labor would be better and perhaps they would have been chucked out. But really, That's the right. Victorian people have no choice. Yes. Oh, you look at the big build, you look at all the CFMEU stuff that's come mm. out in the last few weeks, you're talking about potentially hundreds of millions of dollars that should not have... Been, has gone to places that it wasn't intended no. for. 
Um, Projects billions, yes. billions over budget, years late. Now, let's talk about the UN announcing that nine employee, employees of UNRWA, the Agency for Palestinian Refugees, may have been involved in the October 7 attacks. Opposition leader Peter Dutton has called on the Albanese government to reconsider its funding of UNRWA. He said, we were given assurances up front that nobody was involved in the October 7 atrocities and this is a complete breach of faith. I think people are rightly angry because we're talking about taxpayer dollars here. Patrick, should funding be suspended or at the very least a review be completed into where the money is going and who exactly is involved in this organisation because we've been talking mm. about UNRWA on this network for years and its links with Hamas. Yes, well, I think Peter Dutton is right onto something here. I mean, this is our money. We need to know what it's going towards. Mm. Uh, you've got deep uh, Hamas sympathies within this UN agency. Uh, and you're talking about people here accused not of waving a flag at a protest or saying the wrong thing. They were part... You know, they've been accused of being part of a massacre mm. of 1,300 innocent people uh, on behalf of a, a terrorist organisation that wants to obliterate a, a democracy in Israel. Um, I mean, it's not surprising what's come out in the detail today. But it is shocking. It really is shocking. I can't imagine any other context where that could be, you know, uh, tolerated. That sort of infiltration. And UN Watch has done great work in, in uncovering some of these mm. links. And we've really seen a different approach from Peter Dutton to this entire issue than from Anthony Albanese. It's one of the things that really separates them. Labor seemed to be conflicted with the uh, number of seats where they've got significant Muslim mm. populations and um, they've been really quite uh, permissive of some of the anti-Israel sentiment yes. we've seen in the community, whilst uh, Peter Dutton has had moral clarity on this issue. He has been very strong mm. pretty much from day one. I think the word I read yesterday, the word to describe uh, Albanese's approach to it, is timid, really. And mm. it, in a time when we actually needed strong leadership and we need somebody to stand up and say, this is who we are, this is what we believe in, that didn't happen after October 7. Uh, belatedly, you know, he's, he's, he's made some moves on the anti-Semitic thing. But you're talking about June the following year. You're talking about eight months after it all began. Whereas Dutton, uh, as you point out, has been very clear and very, you know, unequivocal in saying this is right and this is wrong. And I, I think that resonates. Absolutely. And I think, I think it takes courage too because they'd be looking at those seats that Labor hold mm. and... Astute minds within the coalition know that's their future. They can't rely on these blue ribbon teal seats yes. now. That's no longer their their home ground. It is the outer suburbs. It is regional areas. So when you take that position, you do risk alienating mm. segments of that population, but you do it because Absolutely. it's the right thing to do. Now, this next story is going to be very difficult for Patrick indeed. There may even be tears. Just brace yourself because after 15 years with the Tigers, Richmond champion Dustin Martin is retiring from football. He addressed his teammates today and confirmed that after 302 games, his uh, retirement will take effect immediately, Patrick. Immediately. Yes. You can't even say goodbye. Uh, Dusty has said that it's hard to put into words what the Richmond Football Club means to me. I love this place so much. How are you coping? Um, um, will we find you in the fetal position yes. later tonight? Just it is, it is a difficult day, I'll give you that. Um, against that... Um, <laughs> He's one of the great players uh, of a generation. He is one of those players... There are very few who come along. I think of uh, Wayne Carey or Gary Ablett Sr., who actually uh, individually and personally changed the game mm. during that era. And you're talking about Dusty, who won three Norm Smith medals. Mm. No other player has done that. Uh, he was the face of the resurgence of a wonderful club in Richmond, that was in the doldrums for 37 years before that. That's right. You guys did not have a premiership for 37 right. years. And yes. here comes along Dusty. Mm. And now we had three in... Three and four years we three had. Three and, and four years. I could watch And, and your, your supporters are now insufferable. So, you know... <laughs> uh, <laughs> like Collingwood or Carlton supporters, yes. <laughs> Patrick Carline, thank you so much for your time this evening. Thanks, Rita.